Jill, will it turn red or will it just swirl to say that it's recording? It'll turn oh, red. It's, there it's we go. Red. It's recording. It's recording. And I'm going to go to present. And can you see that? Are we good to go? I can't see it yet. Nope. Oh, hold on. It would probably help if I shared my screen screen with you. <laughs> <laughs> Present now. Let's try this. There, there you go. go. All right. Sorry about that. It is a um, learning opportunity today for all of us. View present. All right, we're good now. All right, so welcome everyone. All right, awesome. We are doing a session on discovering how gifted students think and learn. It was um, titled the AIG Brain, but um, we wanted to kind of redefine what the AIG Brain is, and we've we've designated thinking and learning. We've posted a bit.ly there for you so you can follow along with us on the slides if you'd like. And there's a few links that we're going to have you actually click on. So if you'd like to take a moment and just log into our slides, that'd be awesome. So it's bit.ly slash two uppercase V, uppercase H, uppercase E, R, Q, and uppercase U. Say that again, Jill. Um, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash two uppercase V, uppercase H, uppercase E, lowercase R, lowercase Q, and uppercase U. Leave it up there for a few minutes so you can kind of take a look at it. And my name is Jill Turner, and I... Um, We've posted, both Helen and I have posted our emails underneath our, on the very first slide. So if you need to reach out to us at any time, we're more than glad to, um, you know, answer any questions after the fact as well. Absolutely. All right, I'll leave this up for just one more minute and everybody can have it. It will also be at the end of our slides in case um, you don't wanna open it now, but you would like it for reference later on. All right. Um, our agenda for today, so we'll start off with um, our introduction, our why. Um, you're going to take a little quiz for me, a true-false quiz. We're going to define what gifted means, um, talk a little bit about the characteristics of gifted students, um, both cognitively and social and emotional, um, the four C's of 21st century learning and how that applies to gifted learning, a little bit about differentiation and Bloom's taxonomy, DOK, and cognitive rigor, provide you some strategies that work for um, this differentiation of gifted students, some digital tools that you can use for virtual learning and a variety of additional resources to explore on your own when we're finished. So my name is Jill Turner. I'm the media specialist at Central Elementary School. I've been a media specialist. This is my seventh year, but my first year in Currituck. And I'm also the AIG teacher at Central Elementary um, I have a master in library science, add-on certification in gifted and talented. I'm a national board certified media specialist, K-12, and the parent of two AIG students. So um, one of them is highly motivated and um, uses a lot of initiative. The other one is an underachiever. So they're very, very different. Um, both of them have had some issues with exceptionality. One has a sensory integration disorder and the other has a speech delay. Um, due to apraxia. So I've kind of hit the spectrum on all sides of um, the AIG world as a parent as well. My name is Helen Taylor and I am the gifted teacher at Moyoc Elementary and Jarvisburg Elementary. I've been there for the last two and a half years. Prior to that, I was at Charborough Elementary as a classroom teacher in both second and third grade. And then before that, I spent some time as a teacher assistant at Moyoc Elementary. I have a K-6 certification and a K-12 gifted certification. I have a BA in psychology and cognitive science. And in two weeks, I will have my master's in elementary education um, with a curriculum specialist add-on. And then 
in 2021, I will have my master's in school administration as I've started that program as well. Um, I'm also the parent of two AIG students who are also very different. Um, my son is gifted in, academically and intellectually. He's very quick learner, logical, linear. He's that typical successful AIG student. Um, on occasion, he you'll see some underachievement in that due to just kind of lack of motivation or interest. Um, but he's typically that high performer. My daughter is intellectually gifted um, and she is more of that emotional um, AIG student. She has some areas of anxiety, perfectionism, not sure where she got any of that from. Um, she's a very like creative and curious being and she has this kind of sense of like justice for the world. So they're both very different in their um, giftedness. So we come to you um, doing this session because we are both passionate advocating for um, teacher training for gifted students. Um, and we believe that teachers who know how gifted students learn and how they think and are well-trained in gifted education strategies are critical for our students' success at all levels, not just elementary, but straight through high school. So because um, most of our students do spend time in regular classrooms. Um, we're just hoping that this PD will help you identify students who may not be identified already and address their needs both educationally, academically, and emotionally. Awesome, so we wanna know a little bit about you, why you're here, um, kind of what your background is in gifted education. Um, and then we have a little quiz for you to take. So if you look at that link, um, it's AHA slides. It's kind of similar to Menti. Um, and then when you go to that, you can click on that link, or if you just go to ahaslides.com and then your code is just AIG, it's going to ask you initial question. And while you're answering that first question, I'm going to go ahead and do our attendance for this session, and then I will advance, and there'll be several other questions. So I'll give you just a minute to click on that. You can do it from your computer or your phone. Just go to AHA slides, and then the code is going to be AIG. All right, and I'm going to exit out of that for just a minute and go back, back to our meet so I can our meeting attendance. Hopefully this will work. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Perfect. Okay. So it should show everybody in there. Is there anyone that whose name is not on this list, if you can see it? Okay. Do we have everybody? Just pop into chat if you, um, if you think your name is not there and we'll make note of it. All right, Stacy DeSalsi, we need to add her. Yeah. Um, and Lauren Fentress. Okay and Jessica Montaigne. Okay. Can somebody make a, can you or um, Melissa make a note of that and we'll add that at the end. I'm not sure. It's showing me 18 people that, but then on my little clipboard, it's only showing me 13. Um, so we'll figure that out. I'll, I'll do another meet attendance at the end and see if it will populate everyone. All right, so going over to our AHA slides. Our first question was, kind of what do you think your level of expertise is in meeting the needs of gifted students? We just kind of wanted to see what our um, population of people were here. So kind of a wide range. A lot of people kind of more so in that kind of developing stage. So hopefully this information will be helpful to you. All right, sliding over. So we're going to go through a quick little true false. So you should see on your aha slides that hit, the question has advanced and you should be able to start answering. I'll give you just a minute for that.
Helen, can you click on your screen the um, the little white message that says you're sharing your screen? Just there's a tiny little X in the top right corner. Um, Will it go, and so it can go away. Do you see that little? I do not. Yes. This one. Yep. Is that better? That next okay. One. I go back. That next to that. one. Too, if you... All right. So. There it goes. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So people, we have seven true and four false on this one. Going to the next one. Gifted students are fine in the regular classroom because teachers challenge all students. All right, everybody seems to be thinking this is a false statement. Next slide. Gifted students serve as role models in the classroom and make other students smarter. All right, getting a little bit of a mixed opinion on this one. Some say true, some say false. All right, all students are gifted in at least one area. All right, also getting a little bit of a mixed true-false. Ooh, 50-50. All right, next one. Acceleration is socially harmful for gifted students. All right, most people are thinking that is a false statement. Next one. Gifted education programs are elitist. All right, a majority of false on that one. A student who has poor grades should not be identified as gifted. Oh, everybody's saying false. All right. Next one. Gifted students are happy, popular, and well-adjusted in school. All right. We have a majority of you guys saying false on that one as well. And a student with a disability is not gifted. Awesome, everybody's saying false on that one. And then we have one final um, topic for you, um, question. What questions or topics do you hope this session will address? If you can just kind of give us a few words or ideas um, that will help kind of guide our discussions today um, with the, the things we're sharing. I'll give you just a few minutes to share. Give you just about one more minute. Awesome. We really appreciate your feedback um, at the beginning and throughout our 
presentation today and also at the end we'll have a little survey um, so hopefully we can address some of these things for you guys today and um, provide you a little bit of information to help you with your gifted learners in that in the classroom I'm gonna move back over to our presentation and present all right so the true or false, here are all of the statements that you guys just went through and answered for me. So I'm here to tell you that every single one of them is a myth about gifted education in some way or another. Um, gifted students, um, it says a gifted student can learn on their own. Yes, while a lot of our gifted students are independent learners, they deserve a well-trained teacher. They need somebody who's gonna be there to challenge and support them in order to fully develop their abilities. So if they are left alone, they don't always get everything they need. Um, so it's important to make sure we are working with those students in our classrooms as well. And gifted students are fine in the regular classroom because students, um, teachers are challenging everyone. Um, a lot of times, and the reason we're doing things like this and we are encouraging clustering of our gifted students with teachers who are I have that gifted qualification um, certification is that a lot of people are frequently unfamiliar with the needs of gifted students. They know basics of differentiation and things, but gifted students are unique in their own way. There's actually a study that was done that said 58% of teachers have received zero professional development on teaching academically and intellectually gifted students. So definitely something that we want to advocate for and, and grow in our county. Gifted students um, serve as role models in the classroom and can make other students smarter. This actually sometimes um, has an opposite effect. Your average or your below students don't look at those kids as role models. They become frustrated and it affects their self-confidence. Um, and the same with gifted students, they tend to benefit more when they're working with peers of similar performance levels and may become bored or frustrated with um, other students who are unmade, unmotivated or low ability if they're constantly having to um, work with them or tell them things. All students are gifted. While we would like to believe this, every child has their own strengths and positive attributes, but in the educational sense of the world, um, not everyone is gifted. A gifted student is somebody who has an advanced capacity to learn and apply what's learned in one or more subject areas or in um, an intellectual way or maybe in a creative way. They have specific unique learning needs. Acceleration is socially harmful for gifted students. So this is um, kind of a rumor that's gone around that people tend to say, oh, it's not good for them. Um, but the research actually says that it students who are academically gifted or intellectually gifted, they tend to gravitate towards those older peers, those intellectual peers and not those age ability peers. Um, they're happier with older students who share their interests than with the children their same age. Um, it is not right for every student, and it definitely is a process that needs to be collaboration, but it is not necessarily socially harmful for them. Gifted programs are elitist. Um, sometimes this becomes a idea because of our identification procedures. There's very limited funding in the gifted world, no federal money. We get limited state money. Um, so we have to um, be creative with our resources and also with our identification practices. We'll talk a little bit about that in our presentation today that we, there is this um, group of under-identified students. So how do we reach those? How do you as classroom teachers or teacher assistants or support staff help us reach those kids who aren't getting identified by maybe the criteria? Um, and then gifted students are happy, popular, and well-adjusted in school. Um, this is, um, can be so for some, but they also ex have a lot of social emotional issues that come with being gifted. Um, that perfectionism, that anxiety, um, they feel may feel isolated or so there's things that on a social emotional aspect that we have to consider. I think I skipped this one. A student who has poor grades should not be identified as gifted. So we're gonna talk a little bit about underachievement in our gifted learners. I've heard, unfortunately, people have said this, well, I don't understand how he's in the gifted program. He's got a C or he's got a D, he can't be gifted. Well, then we need to figure out why that child has that grade. What is going on? Is it a, is it a home issue? Is it a school issue? Are they not interested? How do we motivate them? How do we support them um, so that their ability matches their intellect. And then a student with a disability is not gifted. 
So we have um, in the gifted world something called twice exceptional, which means you can have a gifted student who also has a learning disability. Um, we also have students who are identified in our ESL programs, may have speech services or a variety of other things. So it's important um, because sometimes they slip through the cracks, especially with the way we do our universal screenings and our testing, that we all work together to make sure that we're serving all kids um, that would benefit from the gifted program. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how we uh, identify gifted students or how they're defined. So the state of North Carolina defines gifted students as having substantially high um, levels of accomplishment through their performance, or they also acknowledge that there's potential to perform at high levels. So some of our students who are underachievers would fall into that category. And um, they compare them to uh, national percentages for our age and their experiences in their schools as well and their environment. Um, <clears throat> they also note that academically and intellectually gifted students um, show high performance capability in not just intellectual areas or academic areas, um, but in both academic and intellectual. When we move on to the national definition of giftedness, it adds some components to that. So it adds the um, idea that students can have high achievement capability areas in not just intellectual and academic, but also creative, artistic, and leadership capacities um, or specific academic fields other than, um, say, your standard math and reading. And um, they also note that uh, these students do require additional services, something outside of the ordinary. In Curatuck, um, we use uh, universal screening in second grade to assess the intellectual intellectual ability of our students. And then we also look at their academic, so that would be their cognitive functioning or their ability to, um, in a non-verbal assessment as well. But And then we um, also, and, and verbal and quantitative. And then we also look at academic um, ability as they go through their EOGs. Um, and we also can use the Iowa test to test students for um, some of that as well. So, but we don't have anything in our, in our identification process um, that allows for any of the creative or leadership abilities. So we really rely on teachers to help identify those um, areas for our students. Um, if you, you know, if there's a teacher who sees someone who has, is um, an, a high achievement in those, in those areas, then, um, we want to definitely nurture those students as well. So, but there's no data testing assessment for those types of things. <clears throat> so what about Trayvon? Maybe you've met Trayvon. Trayvon is underrepresented in demographics. Um, he may be African-American. He may be um, in a high poverty area. He may have had a great deal of trauma in his life. Um, He's outstanding in art and music, um, but hasn't excelled in reading and math. He problem solves beyond his peers. He's absolutely amazing when it comes to um, sort of analyzing pro a problem in the classroom and identifying a need. He demonstrates leadership, but not always in a good way. He may be your student who's misbehaving in class um, because he's bored or misbehaving because you're just not even really sure why. And um, sometimes his teacher will believe he's underachieving. He has incredible talent um, and he comprehends easily. Or what about Maria? Maria is an ELL student. Um, she has come to our country, come out of high poverty and trauma. She's diligent and she shows initiative and language learning but um, and completion of tasks, but she just doesn't, um, isn't able to really understand. So in her assessments, her scores are very low. Um, she demonstrates grit, she overcomes obstacles, she problem solves easily, but she's very quiet and unassuming and, eat and um, doesn't really stand out particularly. She's highly respectful. These students are both AIG students in programs that I've um, been a part of. They're both underserved and both unidentified. So just a couple did you knows. These um, are 
the National Association for Gifted Children organized a campaign called Giftedness Knows No Boundaries to kind of bring advocacy to um, the gifted world and things that we didn't, we don't really think about on a daily basis. So the see me is gifted children in poverty and minority groups are two and a half times less likely to be identified. So we have to work together to figure out how do we get an equitable identification for those under identified and underserved students. And we depend on our classroom teachers and people who work with students every single day to help us with that. Understand me. Some of our brightest students are underachieving because of a variety of needs. So it could be a social emotional need. It could be um, a psychological issue. It could just be boredom, lack of interest. So having the skills in your toolkit to help bring these kids up and give these kids what they need so that they're continuing to grow um, and be nurtured in, in the learning environment. Teach me. Gifted students, like we have said before, have unique learning needs and they benefit from being taught by trained professionals. Um, as teachers, we have a repertoire of things that we do well, but gifted students truly do need someone that has a background in some kind of gifted education. So taking these professional development classes or being certified as a gifted education teacher is going to benefit your classroom. Um, and that's why we really advocate to put our students with teachers who have some gifted edu education background. And finally, um, this one's called Challenge Me. Gifted students um, in elementary school often come to school knowing 50% of the school year material on the very first day of class. Can you imagine? I know that we have all sat through a variety of PDs where we're thinking, oh my goodness, I've heard this over and over again. I already know this. Imagine being that child and knowing all this. So what can we do? What are the strategies? We're going to give you some ideas to make sure that we're challenging those gifted students and those higher level learnings learning learners so that they can achieve to their fullest potential. Um, there's the little link about the campaign um, and kind of the background research from it. All right, uh, Melissa, can we check for questions? We're just going to do a quick stop in our chat and see if there's any concerns or comments. Yeah, if you would look at Lynette Warden. Can you is read it? County -wide, is there a countywide process to help teachers to identify these students at the middle school level? And that's a great question, Lynette. Since we no longer have an AIG teacher serving at this level, which I feel would be great if our county had one at each school, and so do we, Lynette, and we love that you have brought this up in a perfect world, I guess. Yes. If you guys could address that, Helen. Um, we, I don't know that we really have anything written. Um, a few years back, we actually did, like you said, had a gifted person there. Um, but like we said earlier in the presentation, Unfortunately, funding is a major if issue in gifted. And so we are being stretched thin. They've kind of put us at each middle school as kind of a support. So um, I am assigned to Moyak Middle School. I do a lot of paperwork over there, but you are welcome to at any time send any of the AIG teachers a question to say, hey, I've seen these kids or I've seen this in a kid. Um, can you help me? decide if we need to put the, a program in place for them, if we need to create a plan for them and what that would look like at the middle school. Um, I try to look through some of the data in sixth grade or any new students. And I've been working with um, Chelsea, the counselor there for new students that come in that might have gifted plans from other uh, districts or other states, but it's definitely a gap that we would like to kind of grow. So if any of you have ideas or suggestions for the, the middle school world, um, we would be more than willing to take those and work together. Um, definitely something that we, has been on our mind and has been a topic of discussion. Please add those to our exit survey at the end, if you don't mind, that would be great. And I did just now add on there that we do have a district plan. I know all of you know it, but if you're like me and you're new to this district or maybe you're so overwhelmed in the classroom, you haven't read it. It's I forget how many pages. It's quite lengthy, but there is information and in it is on the domain for Curry Tuck K-12. And I just put that link there if you're interested in further analyzing it. Awesome. Thank you. very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't All see right. any other questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and type them in because we are monitoring and we'll bring them up and would love to hear from you.
All right. Awesome. Thank you. So a little bit about the characteristics of gifted students. Um, we have said this over and over again, but there is a wide variety of individual differences within our population of gifted students. No one student is the same. There's not a one size fits all to identify, oh, all of these students have this exact characteristic. So that makes them gifted. Everybody is kind of unique and different. Um, within the gifted world. There are a variety of factors that play into this. Genetics, life experiences, personality, their family experiences, their relationships, um, their educational experiences that have um, they've experienced through their life all play a role in their strengths and their characteristics that, um, of a gifted student. There are domains of giftedness. Jill touched base on this a little bit in the definition. Um, intellectual and academic are two that we focus on in Currituck County that we identify under. Um, they also talk about creative leadership and visual and performing arts with artistic um, domain of giftedness. While we don't specifically identify in our county for those three, we do try to nurture those um, within our gifted population. I know some districts and some states um, specifically have plans for identifying a um, gifted student in those areas, but we don't currently do that in Currituck County. Um, again, there's no universal consensus on the definition of giftedness. We have um, a variety of psychologists who have studied this topic for years and years and years, and they've created a variety of definitions and models based on their research about what they think it means to be gifted, what it looks like, um, what a, the characteristics or a child's brain looks like in this area. Several organizations have created definitions to match their platforms, the National Association for Gifted Children, um, and some other ones that we'll share at the end of this presentation. And finally, um, every state kind of has created their own definition. A lot of them are modeled after the federal definition, but they all kind of take on their own form. And then within the state, so within North Carolina, we have, like she shared, our own definition, but then each district is allowed to create a plan um, and how we're going to approach I um, serving and identifying our gifted population. So it's different from Currituck to Dare County to Camden. Even within our region, it looks a little bit different from um, county to county. Here are some common characteristics of gifted students. I'm not going to read all these to you, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, why we like knowing these creates behaviors, both positive and negative. So for example, a child that is a rapid learner, their positive behavior is that they might be able to memorize and master facts very quickly. But then the negative side of that is that they are quickly bored or they resist the drill, you know, and they want to then start bothering others, which creates issues. So understanding what these characteristics are and how to handle the behaviors that come with them is extremely important. Um, another example is that they retain a quantity of information. So they're ready to recall and respond but then you, I'm sure, have that kid in your class who is the one that wants to monopolize every discussion. They're always the one that has something to say every time. So it's trying to find that balance and support for that. Um, some social emotional characteristics um, of gifted students are listed here. Just two that I'll give you an example of. Um, very curious and tend to have a variety of interests. So the positive side of that is that they do ask a lot of questions and they get excited about ideas. But sometimes they, the negative side is that they'll go on tangents or there won't be any follow through. Um, and then they are self-motivated. They have that intrinsic motivation, um, which tends to require minimum teacher direction or help. But then they can get a little aggressive or they want to challenge your authority in the classroom. So it's just kind of important to understand the different characteristics that may come with a gifted child. We're not saying every child has all of these characteristics. We're not saying this is the limit to the characteristics of gifted. These are just some of the things that are commonly seen um, and understanding that both positive and negative behaviors can emerge from these variety of characteristics. As we look at uh, education and the theoretical education of how gifted students um, work, how their brains work, how the cognitive piece of, of their intellect works. Um, some, of, some theorists and um, researchers have done a great deal of work on trying to identify how to come up with some kind of criteria or um, maybe categories that we can think about when we think about giftedness. So trying to clump some of those characteristics together in, um, in areas to help teachers and, and researchers in general to understand um, what giftedness looks like. 
So neuro studies, there's just some facts to know, but neuro studies show that no two brains are alike and that each brain has a distinctive signature, like a fingerprint. Um, so none, in the same way that none of our students exhibit the same characteristics, they also cognitively don't function the same as well. So there's a few theorists that we want to look at. Um, and a lot of theorists are addressed in our teacher education programs. Part of the um, research that and the articles that have come out are just how um, when you actually get into the teaching experience, the practicality of knowing those theories doesn't really help so much. You, you know about it, but well, then what do you do with that information? So today we're just going to take a look at both um, a little bit of, of, of three of the th three theorists um, and uh, a little bit of the research. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about strategies. So theory versus strategies. Um, theories alone doesn't always help us. Strategies alone, we need to understand the foundation of where they come from. Um, but when you incorporate that theory into the strategies for the classroom, then you have an informed practice. And so that's what we're going for today. So the first person we're going to look at is Howard Gardner, um, his multiple intelligences. He grouped student characteristics into eight areas. And he said that kids um, are, have all of these eight areas, in, um, but excel, our gifted students excel in one, at least one of them. Um, so the eight areas are visual, musical, kinesthetic, interpersonal, linguistic, mathematical, naturalistic, and interpersonal. It will represent both their interests and um, their abilities in those areas. Um, I should say this, that in all three of these um, people that we're going to be talking about today, I've chosen um, theorists, Helen and I chose theorists that really apply to all children because um, we understand that a number of children are unidentified and we also want you to have something that you can take away and, um, and apply to your whole classroom, not just to our gifted students. So when we talk about these, I'll try to distinguish between just the theory in general and then how it impacts our gifted students as well. So with Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences, um, we know that our students are excelling in, in one or more of these areas. Um, I also want to just make a comment here based on Daniel Willingham's research that their abilities are different than learning styles. He has done a great deal of research on the cognitive scientists and he's done a lot of research in um, cognitive psychology and um, more recently in the past 10, 15 years in um, relating it to learning. Um, he has uh, noted that there is no research that supports students having a particular learning style that they can learn all topics in. He said that ability or his research indicated that students um, best known for, uh, Helen, I think we might have lost our screen there. But students' ability, when, they, when they're when they going to le learn math, there's best ways, best practices for teaching math. So you don't need to feel like you need to teach math using art just because students have a strength in art. It doesn't work that way. Um, there's no research that indicates um, that learning styles, that students can learn all things using one learning style better than other things. So just to note that, he has some, done some really interesting research. And if you're interested in exploring it more, um, <clears throat> he's definitely a person to to um, follow or learn more about. Um, so the second theory that we're gonna look at today is Renzulli's theory. And Renzulli has a, a triad model. He looks at three different um, components to um, address how to identify or the characteristics, or we may even say how um, students' brains work think, learn. Um, he took looks at their general ability and um, that would cover abstract thinking, the verbal and numerical reasoning, spatial relations, memory, word fluency. Um, it would, um, it looks at how they look at novel situations that they might encounter, uh, covers some of their um, ability to process information rapidly. Um, it could, he also identifies in that above average ability section, the um, capacity for acquiring 
um, specific knowledge, advanced knowledge in a specific area. So not just in general. And um, the second thing that he looks like, I don't think our slides are advancing there, Helen. Is it um, stuck? Is it going now? Ah, yes. yep. Okay, next one. One more. I didn't, I'm not going right. to all the information on these slides, but I did put it in there so you could go back and just look at it um, specifically in each area. And it might give you a better idea for um, ways to challenge and understand and identify students. So um, the second aspect of his triad is creativity. And so he identifies people as being well above average in their ability <clears throat> if they um in the area of cre he, creativity. So flexibility, fluency, originality of thought all fall under that. Openness to new experiences, if they're curious, if they're sensitive to detail, those types of things fall under creativity. And then the third section, or the third circle in this triad is their task commitment. So we have students who are highly motivated and um, show high levels of interest and enthusiasm for a task and we'll jump on it. And then we have our students who are um, maybe not so great at persevering. Um, so in his model, he says that if they have a high level of task commitment, that does set them apart. So he uses a sort of Venn diagram where those three levels overlap. You can see in the top corner there of the slide, those students who have all three of those are easily identified as gifted. Um, but he also has a school-wide enrichment model because, uh, and I think that's very helpful for our under-identified and underserved people, students, because they, um, you'll note that even though some students don't have a strong task commitment, they can still be identified. And we're seeing, I think, more and more of students who just aren't really motivated in the same way maybe um, we would think of gifted learners as being motivated. So um, that is Ranzuli. And his theory is going to Im impact our practice. Um, the third one I'd like to look at with you is Taylor. Taylor um, is known for his cre um, creativity. When people talk about Calvin Taylor, they talk about um, creative talent. And um, he takes an approach using this, I call it the totem pole diagram. <laughs> so um, what he does is he acknowledges that typical intelligent tests like the COGAD that we administer universally in second grade only identify a small fraction of students with talent. Um, he says that multiple talents should be evaluated in our classrooms. And he has identified nine different talent areas that he would like us all to look at. Um, he said, if we do this, that students will experience um, both motivation and reward in learning. Um, and it also acknowledges that students, or, or he believes that students are above average in at least one of these talent areas. So the reward for them is um, knowing that they're uh, talented in something. And so it just um, is affirming for the student. Um, uh, it focuses on the optimum of self-actualization and productivity. So in this model, what a teacher would do is they would take this totem diagram and list their students down on the left-hand side and then assess their students. Where do you think your student falls in terms of academic areas? Are they um, high or low in those areas? Productive thinking, communicating, forecasting. And then what you do is you place the student in um, a high or low level. And then the connecting lines here indicate each student's individual strength. So this is sort of a compilation of this teacher's whole class, um, but you would do this individually for each student. So I might have a scale of, um, if I had 20 students, I would place them how they fell in the area of academics, like my lowest student, my highest student. So it's not, it's against the other students in your class, in other words. I hope that makes sense. And then when you look at it and you're designing lessons and learning experiences for them, you try to appeal not just to the area of their strength, but also the areas that they might have the most weakness in. So for our friend Anne here, she's second highest in the class academically, but not so high in, um, say, forecasting, which is sort of predicting what would happen next. So I would 
um, design some learning experiences for Anne that would um, give her an opportunity to practice that skill. So that's uh, just a brief tailor in a nutshell, but it's a really awesome model and a lot of fun to do with your class and to and it's a similar way of thinking about your students. And okay, next we're going to um, just take a minute to stop. Is this stop for questions here or no? We're keeping moving on, I think. Get we're keeping moving on. Yeah. yeah, let's keep moving on. Okay, so why are the four C's important for students? Uh, the four C's are critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. They're particularly important for our gift. They're important for all students. It's another one of those. Um, things that we were talking about. We believe that all students need these opportunities, but gifted students especially need these opportunities to address some of the questions that you had earlier in the survey. Like, um, you know, how do you create a challenging experience for them? Or um, are there any new ways to challenge them in their daily lessons? Using the four C's is how um, we would recommend that you go about and design some of those experiences. They'll also keep them engaged, um, hopefully give them motivational type projects uh, to complete. So the things that work for AIG students are when you create the experiences that are real life, real time, and very, very relevant. So they want, um, when you set up a scenario or a PBL that looks like that, then they inc incorporate the four C's, the critical thinking, the creativity, the communication, and collaboration, then that is when they will um, hit that point of flow where they're kind of in the flow and they're really focused on achieving theoretically. Um, and I think by giving them voice and choice in the projects that they are doing, you also um, using these C's, it also engages them as well. Um, you're also hitting higher order thinking when you're doing critical thinking, um, which will keep them um, challenged. And then typically when we design these types of experiences using these four C's, they're really exceptional and extraordinary opportunities for our students that maybe go beyond what you're able to do with other students in the classroom. Um, it's important to recognize that our teacher, our students have multiple potentiality, like they're good in lots of things. And um, so we wanna give them a broad range of experiences. And if we look back to the theories we just talked about, we can look at those nine different um, concepts in Taylor's model or the eight concepts in multiple t intelligences and design some of our learning experiences using those incorporating the four C's. Um, and then I guess this is sort of a standard thing we always say, but when we teach our children using the four C's, we're giving them the skills that they need to go on and use, do jobs and be ready for the future. So we're creating lifelong learners when we give them the opportunity to work together to share what they know, the communication, to be creative in their approaches and to, uh, problem solving and um, think critically about their work. Um, moving on to a little bit about differentiation. I know you guys have heard this word thrown around all the time, but how does that apply in the gifted world and to our gifted learners? So um, my little cartoon in the top you may have seen if you've um, had any exposure to the gifted is unfortunately we are split between schools and we have block times where we are only seeing our students sometimes twice a week for a 45 minute block. But that doesn't mean that's the only time that they're gifted. They are a gifted student 24 seven. So we have to be able to collaborate with you all and provide strategies and support so that they're getting what they need in your regular classrooms as well. So differentiation is all about focusing on the student's individual needs and having an appropriate balance of challenge and success, not just for your gifted students, but for all learners in your classroom. Um, it's based on your student's abilities. So that definitely applies to your gifted student. Um, are they an academic gifted student? Are they intellect? Are they both? What areas are they in? Their interests and their learning profiles. Um, differentiation can be a whole class thing. It can be small group. It can be individualized education. I know oftentimes um, our classroom teachers are have so much on their plate. So to even try and think about what is this going to look like? Our gifted students are, you have that, oh, they're going to be fine. They're already performing well. So sometimes they don't always get 
what they need um, as far as differentiation goes. So, but it's important to differentiate it for our gifted learners to make sure they are getting that appropriate challenge, that they're growing and that their class time with you is being used effectively. Um, just a little saying that I like to say is that every child deserves to learn something new every day. So like we said in the beginning that a lot of these elementary students are coming in knowing 50% of the content. I want our gifted students to be excited and motivated to come to school and wanting to learn new things. So we have to provide that level of differentiation so that they are learning something new. So how do you differentiate in your class for your gifted learners or any learners? Making sure that you know your specific standards and objectives, which I know we have beat down in the elementary world, and I'm sure at some of the other levels as well. Knowing your students, knowledge of students is essential and now understanding what those characteristics of gifted learners are, what um, a specific learner has, what characteristics is this child showing specifically. Um, it's important to make time to work, like I said, with those gifted learners, both in small groups and individualized attention. Um, I know that your time is valuable, but I think it would do the student and you a world of good to kind of maybe take some time out to really work with them individually. Um, it also, and Jill's going to talk a little bit about this, but good differentiation truly requires ongoing and thoughtful assessment, um, starting with that pre-assessment. So some ways that we um, differentiate are through content, what students can learn, process how students learn the product, how they demonstrate their knowledge of um, what they've learned, and then even environment, um, where and with whom they are learning. So lots of different options there. Um, types of differentiated instruction that we talk about is um, our enrichment, extension, and acceleration. So your enrichment is like pursuing topics that are related to their interest at higher levels of difficulty and complexity, than just the regular class curriculum and classroom. Um, a lot of what we do in our gifted program is on an enrichment basis. Extension is kind of that deepening and broadening of the curriculum, making them um, work at higher cognitive level with using advanced critical and creative thinking skills and might be focused on a single discipline. Your acceleration um, can be content-based or grade-based. Um, acceleration is definitely something where you really need to collaborate with a group of people to make decisions in the best interest of a gifted student. Content um, can be just like a single subject acceleration, maybe in math or reading, maybe they go up to the next grade level. Um, it might look like an AP or an IB or a DE class in the high school level. Um, providing our middle school students with high school classes. I know there's been some discussion about, is that really beneficial? Um, but I think it's important and it needs to be um, individualized for each learner. And then your grade-based acceleration. This is not common, um, but can be very beneficial for some gifted students. Um, it might look like an early entrance to kindergarten. It might look like a whole grade acceleration. Um, it might look like early entrance to college at the high school level, someone that's graduating early because they've mastered what they need to master at that time. We use in Currituck County um, the Iowa Acceleration Scale, which is a in-depth process to go through the academics, the intellect, the social. Um, we have parent input and classroom teacher input and gifted education input on whether or not that is truly the best choice. Um, so just making sure you re remember that differentiation is all about knowledge of your individual learners, really getting to know those students um, academically and beyond the classroom. So I just want you to kind of stop and reflect. You don't have to talk, but if you want to make some comments just for us to read in the chat box or just want to personally think to yourself, I want you to think about what you are doing in your current classrooms or um that you, how you differentiate for your higher level learners or your gifted students. I know that we all differentiate, we all are doing things, but what specifically for those high level learners or those gifted students are you truly doing? And why did you make the decision to do that? What, what was your purpose? What knowledge or data or what background did you use to make those decisions? And what are the challenges that come from trying to differentiate for a gifted learner? Um, which is something that we can help support. I know we say that a lot. We talk about collaboration and unfortunately time and schedules sometimes get away from us, but it is definitely something that we want to encourage and we want to continue to grow here in Currituck County is having that collaboration between the gifted world and the regular education world. So just take some time to kind of reflect and think about that. If you want to make a comment, great. If you just want to kind of personally reflect, that is fine as well. 
Um, moving um, on a little bit about Bloom's taxonomy, we've all heard, and DOK levels. I know the elementary school worked on um, some DOK work with Christy Hodges last year. Um, I'm not sure what that looked like at the middle school or high school levels, but both of these tools encourage kind of a critical and creative thinking process. They both focus on high order level questioning, requiring students to kind of test ideas, create new ideas. Bloom's taxonomy is a providing different levels of complexity related to the type of thinking that is required. Um, also something I learned uh, after becoming a gifted education professional is that there's actually three domains in the Bloom's world. Um, and this is just the focus in cognitive domain. Bloom's actually has a psychomotor and affective domain all, as well. So it's really focusing on that type of thinking. Your depth of knowledge is focusing more on that deeper thinking, how the depth of knowledge, de depth of thinking, and to what extent that information can be transferred or used in a variety of contexts. There's four um, DOK levels um, that are intended for your student learning outcomes determines what level you're on within that DOK framework. Um, depth and of content and task are also considered here. So when we talk about cognitive rigor, rigor is another one of those educational words that um, gets thrown around, but there is a cognitive rigor matrix that was developed from re some research um, by Hess that kind of blends our blooms and our DOK thinking. It's combining that type of thinking with that deeper level of thinking. Um, and it takes, uh, I know you may have seen this if you have any background in blooms and DOK, there were some images where it would try and line everything up. But what this cognitive rigor matrix does is says that you can have a DOK level of one, two, three, four at all of the Bloom's levels. So we can have um, a level four, that extended thinking in DOK, even in our understanding. It's about having a deeper understanding, a deeper application, a deeper analysis of what you're having those students doing. So question here, I'm just kind of to think about how do you create a learning environment where all of the students in your classroom, gifted included, are expected to learn, that you're supporting them so that they can learn, and that they're just demonstrating a learning at a high level, um, setting those expectations high and helping students to be successful, um, even students who aren't gifted or are struggling to learn. A couple resources here that I shared with you, um, Cognitive Rigor in Today's Classroom is a great little article um, just a little bit about the research and background on that blending and how that can apply in your classroom. And then they actually created some matrices, which um, I found that are quite interesting where they apply it specifically to like math or science or reading and writing and gives you examples about what it looks like kind of in this chart. Can, when I look at analyze and I want to look at a level four, what does that look like in a math or a writing or a science context and gives you some ideas there. So definitely a resource to kind of explore depending on your content area. Um, a lot of times in our gifted world, we want to stay in that level four of the DOK, that extended thinking. How can they apply it to something new and create and generate new ideas related to their learning? Um, I know that these three blooms are often associated with lower um, order thinking and the three here are associated with higher order thinking, but we can still, like I said, use these lower order thinking and apply them to a level four DOK for our gifted students. So lots of um, opportunity and choice to kind of bring rigor to your classroom. So bringing all that together, differentiation, rigor, and relevance, it helps us to focus on our individual student needs. It helps us to think um, about learning and teaching in new and interesting ways. And it helps to increase student engagement and motivation. Um, I found this s'more newsletter. That's this link right here of a woman who really kind of broke down differentiation, broke down rigor, broke down relevance, has some great graphics about what that means and what it looks like in a classroom. And then I have a book recommendation. I know Jarvisburg did this as a book study um, I think right when I had started there, I didn't get to participate in the book study, but I did read the book. It is a great book that would apply to all students. It's interactive. So if you have some free time on your hands, which <laughs> you might at this point, um, check out that book and see, let me know what you think. I think it would be very beneficial for your classroom. All right, check in for questions. Helen. Um, it is two o'clock.
Do we, just a housekeeping question for you. Do you want to continue um, recording and finish this? If people need to leave, we certainly would understand. Or do you want to um, stop and do a part two? Um, I'm guessing we- I say we keep going and if people, it'll be recorded. Yeah, if they want, I mean, is that okay with you? That's fine with me. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Great. Okay. That's fine so if you need to leave, um, let me, I'm going to do a quick, um, just meeting again, just to make sure I have everybody. And if you need to leave, we completely understand that. Helen Linetti had a question about um, how you to are utilize pre-assessment for a unit. Well, and it's something, um, something that I think is important. It's a, it's a great tool to use to determine what your students already know. If uh, you guys want to con uh, comment on that a little. We'll be talking about that a little bit as we get into the strategies, which is in our next session. So. Okay. Using pre-assessments. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to continue on and talk a little bit about um, the strategies. Some of your questions earlier were um, related to not just uh, strategies in general, but virtual strategies. So I'm going to try to make a leap as we go along and um, tie some of that in together. Um, but feel free to pop any uh, thoughts into the chat while we do this. All right. So... Um, as Melissa mentioned, we um, begin all, almost all of our strategies, and certainly the three strategies we're going to be talking about today with a pre-assessment tool. Um, pre-assessing is important when you talk about mastery, and a lot of times when we're using our differentiation strategies with students, particularly our AIG students, it's um, it begins with um, being able to identify where they're at so we know what to do with them next. I think we lost our slide presentation, and I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay. So Helen's going to work on getting the slides back up again. I'm going to just keep talking and, um, and let, let you catch up a little bit with the slides in a minute. We're going to talk about three strategies today. The first is anchoring activities. The second is curriculum compacting, and the third is tier, uh, tiering our instruction or tiered instruction. So anchoring activities, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with them, they provide meaningful work in a content area that's um, specifically designed when tasks are finished. So our fast finishers, our AIGs fall into that. Um, or sometimes we set them up so when, stu when students first come into the classroom, they begin with an anchoring activity. Anchoring activities are always connected to your objectives. They're designed with the content um, in mind, but they lend themselves to choice. So sometimes you'll see them laid out in like three different activities they can choose from, or you might see like a tic-tac-toe board, something like that. Um, if you just, des they're designed, um, best for content that lends itself to choice. So when, all right, Helen's uh, back in. I'm so sorry. Um, of course, yay technology, my internet went completely out. <laughs> That's okay. I love, I love CenturyLink. Um, <laughs> we um, started into the anchoring activities, just talking about what they are. Uh, so okay. that's where we're going to very first slide. <clears throat> all right. It's okay. Still recording. So anchoring activities always have a time limit. We, it's not an activity that you're using as a key part of um, or a whole class um, part of your discussion you're going, or part of your learning experience. They're designed as sort of a supplemental type of thing that you can use with students um, for a limited amount of time while you work with other students. So say you have a group of students that you really need to reteach on a math concept. Um, but you want the other students to continue to be learning, then what you would do is design an activity or a couple different activities for them 
that they could choose from to work on while you're working with the, the lower group. You still can't see the presentation. Um, you can't see. All right, let's give me a minute. Okay. <clears throat> I apologize. Um, you're fine. You're fine. All right, so beyond pre-assessing the students um, to see kind of where they're at and which ones so that you can design these activities so they're challenging, um, you're also going to just think about your students and what they're interested in, and you're going to uh, think about the areas that they're struggling in and maybe design some activities around that. Sometimes these things, these anchoring activities look like centers. Um, so on the slide that Helen has up now, you can see that um, they can be in any subject or content area. And so what I've done here is I've given you some examples of the anchoring activities down below, journaling, the learning centers, um, supplemental reading, research projects, um, choice boards or tic-tac-toe um, boards, web quests, uh, even silent reading, investigations. Those kinds of things are all examples of anchoring activities. When you're planning an anchoring activity, um, you're going to go in and identify your um, standard that you're working on, and then you're going to um, think about some optional activities for students that you might like them to do if they finish early related to those standards. So um, there's an example there of an anchoring activity uh, that I designed on Cornell Notes and kind of gives you an idea. So the rest of this um, lesson plan includes the standard and um, where, you know, what the, you know, what students would be learning or relearning, which was how to actually take Cornell notes step by step. So they, um, the ones that fa finished first went on and chose one of these three activities once they mastered the concept of Cornell notes to, um, to go ahead and uh, move, you know, move on to the next step in uh, sort of expressing their knowledge about that. So um, why does it work well for AIG students? Um, it works well for them because they typically can finish fast and they're motivated by the alternative activities that they could possibly do. These, these are usually the fun activities. So they, um, they like them. You can also design them to be a little bit more abstract and um, still based on the knowledge of this particular standard and content. But um, if they're novel or interesting, it, it, it sparks for them. So it's a way to keep them engaged. Um, it's a way to give them a challenge, um, but it's it's a short activity. So this is different than, um, you know, tiered instruction. Okay. Um, when they're working on it, they work on it for the specific period of time. It can extend over a couple days, um, and you can design the choices that you give them in the different multiple intelligence areas or different learning, you know, different learning styles. Give them a choice so they can choose if they, you know, are feeling artistic that day, they could do um, something that's artistic, or if they love music, they can create a song. That's the idea with that. With that. <clears throat> Making this virtual. <laughs> so a great way to do this virtually is to give them um, an, a hyperdoc type document or slide where you have links um, for, for things on that slide. And so they can choose um, to do this activity, this activity, or this activity. If you're doing Google Classroom, you could um, create a topic of anchoring activities and um, they could pick and put their choices in there and they can pick one um, of the, put in three assignments, for example, they could pick one of them and then um, go do some exploration. Web quests would be perfect um, for this virtually. Okay. Um, the next strategy is curriculum compacting. And curriculum compacting is a little bit different. You still begin with the pre-assessment. That's super important because you need to know what your students know. As Helen mentioned earlier, most of our kids come to school knowing about 50% of the content already are, are AIG students. So we are, are sometimes afraid to let to compact them out because we don't um, we want to just make sure that they know it. So Prius, and we don't want them, you know, to, to move on and, and miss a foundational um, building block of the, of the knowledge that we're sharing. So pre-assessment pre gives you an idea of what they do know and if they do understand the standard that you're teaching. And, and um, then you can have some reassurance that 
um, they're going to be okay with that. So after you've pre-assessed them, you identify who's who's got it already and who you need to teach. So if it's it's usually the students being compacted out are are not um, there's not a lot of them necessarily because um, if there were you would um, you would probably have moved on to the next standard at that point. So these are for your kids who really already know it almost from the very beginning um, or get it really quickly. You're going to uh, modify the content or they can sometimes you can compact in two ways. You can do um, additional activities that are extended from the standards that you're currently teaching, similar to the anchoring activities that we just talked about. Or you could go ahead and compact them out and allow them to pick a topic that they're interested in. There's your voice and choice again. And um, allow them to, to use the intelligence and interests and, um, and modalities of expression that, um, that they you know, would prefer. So voice and choice. And then um, one of the great things about compacting that I think is really important um, is giving them a chance then to share back what they've learned or what they've experienced. Um, experience through the compacting activities with their class um, at the end. So bringing them all back together and um, letting them share some of that. Um, this will sometimes require you to streamline your instruction first for these students to make sure that they know all of the concepts within the standard. So a lot of times they'll have most of the standard, but there's just one little piece that they don't know. So you would just streamline instruction for them and then compact them out. Um, it also allows time for enrichment. Um, and so one of the questions was, how do I integrate um, my teaching with the AIG programs that are already there? And this is a great way to work with the AIG teachers to um, identify your students who actually need enrichment. So they can go ahead um, when they're ready to be compacted out, um, you can pull in that AIG teacher for consultation to work with you on designing activities in the classroom or to just, um, maybe that's the time they can go to AIG, depending on your scheduling. Um, let's see, uh, some basics. It enables a more challenging, productive use of the student's time. Um, one of the things that we've noted is kids really do lose motivation and engagement when they um, aren't learning something new. So if they feel like they know it all, they can get into this habit of, of not being engaged and then sort of disconnect. and. Um, I think we that's one of the things that we're concerned about now during this particular time where we're working with kids digitally and um, we're, we're not really, um, you know, it's a little more difficult to differentiate digitally um, given the time that we have with our students is so brief. So um, compacting out um, could be a strategy that we could use to differentiate. So these kids are learning this in a, um, in a group and then the students that are compacted have a different time they meet with you to um, work on their projects or whatever. Um, so this is just me being the media coordinator, but you can also pull your media coordinators into this when it comes to research or your media specialists because um, that's one of the um, bits of information that we love to share with students, how to do research projects and help them to do research projects. So it's a great time to use your media specialist as a resource. Um, all right, um, I'll let you, you know, just continue on to look at compacting there. Um, I've included a flow chart for compacting. So how do you compact a lesson? Um, as you go through the steps in this flow chart, I think that, that will help you to work through that. Um, it's also important to determine how you're going to measure your success. So we've compacted the students out. They're not getting the normal sets of grades that students um, who have not mastered the content are going to get. So how are you going to give um, this compacted student an equitable grade? So rubrics are an important part of this process um, as well for that. Um, and then there's an example of compacting there. Um, that was designed by one of my classmates in an AIG class. Um, she does a super job. So you can take a look at that. Um, you'll notice that they have choice again um, in their work board. And that is a, um, the original of that is a hyperdoc. So it was something that could be shared with second graders online and um, second or fourth. And then, um, you know, they went in and they were able to work independently um, with just checkbacks with the teacher. All right, so 
like um, anchoring activities and actually like tiered instruction that we're going to talk about next, it's important that we train our students on how to do this. If we just say, okay, we're going to compact, here's a, here's a contract, we're going to agree on certain things, um, and now we're going to go do it. Um, they just, they've never, if they've never done it before, they just have no idea what that's supposed to look like. It's really important to chunk it down and to give them um, specific instruction in each step of the process. So this um, steps for successful contacting is something that you can share with students and then go through each of the steps and make sure that they understand that this is the process. And um, when they're contracting with you to do this process, that these are the things that they're going to need to do. And, um, and understand not just what it is, but how to go about doing it. So um, then the, uh, the diagram on the right is the elements of a learning contract. There's lots of learning contracts online, so I didn't pull a specific one in, but I think um, it's important to include those things there. All right, um, our next strategy is tiered instruction. <sighs> And um, tiered instruction is, uh, is the most complex of the three strategies that we're going to be talking about today. Again, you're going to begin with um, a pre-assessment. You're gonna consider the concept that you want to teach. Um, and I'm gonna preface this by saying that this strategy, like the others, is a very upfront loaded um, time for a teacher's planning. So it's not, um, it's something that you have to put the time into in advance when you're structuring your lessons. It's so effective as a tool for differentiation that many teachers, once they master the art of it, um, find it moves a lot more quickly and they use it in, um, in almost every major thing that they do. Um, that's not how we recommend that you start though. We recommend that you start with just one particular standard that you want to teach and go ahead and um, attempt, you know, make the um, the goal of setting, uh, designing tiered instruction for that one topic. So tiered instruction has three tiers. It's in some ways very similar to the RTI process, um, or uh, <clears throat> so. Um, I think if you, you know, if you've had some training in that, um, then. Um, it may, may make a little bit more sense up front. But there, um, the, the bottom tier is the, e, is the level that's standard for, um, for most of your students. The middle tier, um, I should say for your lowest students, <laughs> maybe not most in our cases, but the lowest students, the middle tier is the tier that's um, going to have a little bit more advancement. And then the next tier up is the tier that um, we are going to find our AIG students fall into when you're designing a lesson. <clears throat> I was advised to always start my tiering with the lowest level students. Um, my tendency is to want to start with my AIG students and then tier down, but it's uh, more effective to actually tier up, I think, uh, in, the long, in the long run when you're doing this strategy. All right, so what is tiered instruction? Let's just go back a little bit. Um, teachers tier their activities um, so that all the students get in their individual needs met in that particular area. Um, we know that our classes are not ho homogeneous and um, we know that our students, even, clump, even designing three different levels of activities will probably may not meet all of their needs, but um, it's a step towards differentiating individually for our students. So begins, of course, with the pre-assessment, identifying their readiness and their ability in, and their knowledge of a content area. Um, it's also important to uh, not just think about this academically, but you can also to your instruction in other ways. Like you can base it on student interest. Um, you can base it on how hard they work. Um, so it doesn't just have to be academic, even though we think about that as AIG teachers, I think maybe a little bit more. All right, include, you can do, you do this in any class, any subject. Um, in this case, there's not choice. It's teacher assigned and um, rather than the content being chosen by the student, um, it does require student training. So you need to teach your students 
a couple things. You need to teach them how to work independently in small group, and you need to teach them that not equal is not always equitable. So a lot of times um, teachers don't hear instruction. They don't give um, similar but um, different assignments to different kids in their class because they don't want the kids to feel like they're different. They don't want the parents to come back and say, why does Johnny have this assignment, but my child got this assignment? Um, and so um, there's sort of a hesitancy sometimes on our part to, to actually start this process. But when you really think about it and start to talk to your children about their different interests and abilities, um, they recognize very quickly that they're all unique and different. And they may, um, they may be at the lowest level in one topic, but a higher level in another one. So it's when you um, start out by teaching them uh, that it's important that all students get their needs met rather than everybody get the same thing. That's, um, that's one of the first steps in making this work. So when you're starting tiered instruction, you usually take a couple weeks to just practice in the classroom and give students different tasks and, um, and kind of let them talk about it and figure it out. And after about two weeks of sort of chunking it and working through that particular step, they're ready to go on tiered instruction in general. Okay. Um, let's see. So also tiered assignments can minimize discipline issues and class management issues um, because um, the theory is when you tier instruction, all the students are engaged and they get into the flow of working on what they're working on. And so they're, um, you know, they're not gonna have all the strat the difficulties with um, people popping out. It's also a great way to incorporate the four C's. So they're working collaboratively. Um, you include communication tools, um, then they can share what they're learning with you and with their peers. And um, when you're designing it, you can design it with the creative elements to it um, and critical thinking based on the level of their need. <clears throat> okay, so um, I hope that gives you sort of an overview of what tiered assignments are. We use it with AIG students because um, it's a great way to for them to find challenge um, and access and success in, um, in what they're doing. Um, it overcomes that boredom factor and it gives them a chance to excel um, while working on the exact same standard as the rest of the class. Um, just an assignment that uh, is at a deeper level or has more rigor. Um, we referred, uh, Helen shared with you the HESS um, chart there to, to build rigor into assignments. And that is a really important tool in tiered assignments. So it's not that the task has to be super complex necessarily. It just has to hit that, that um, DOK level, higher level of four for AIG students. So using that chart in conjunction with tier, uh, planning and tiered instruction um, is really helpful. Okay, how do you begin? Pre-assess. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, um, I'm just going to stop you for just a quick second. Okay. I think after we get through this that we're just going to kind of quick go through um, the resources and they can kind of explore those on their own so that we can kind of wrap this up in the next five minutes, maybe. Perfect. Yep, that'd be perfect. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm sorry. Do you need me to shorten this part? Uh, maybe just hit some points. I just I know people have other things and we had said an hour right. and we're at an hour and a half. So I just want to respect everybody's time. And um, I know it's a lot of information and we do appreciate everyone staying and listening. Um, but I think just maybe hit on a couple quick points here and then we'll just talk about the resources at the end. OK, perfect. So um, how do you do it? So I'll let you read through how to begin. Um, but let's go to the next slide and just look at steps for planning. So I included that. Um, diagram there, which is kind of pretty helpful for determining activities. And then uh, note the four by four matrix, because that and the rigor um, chart that Helen shared with you earlier are going to be helpful. So when we're tiering assignments, we look at three parts. We look at the content we want to teach, how we're going to teach the process and the product that we want students to have at the end. And in each tier, we base what our choices are for those things, not the content, because that's going to be the same for all of them. Um, though at the higher levels, we might get more specific. So in this example, they're using rules and laws, um, but they're talking about the Bill of Rights. So they went out of the general and into the more specific for the higher level students so that they could um, analyze something that was very real and very relevant. Um, 
The product can also be differentiated, but it's important to make sure that all of our kids create at whatever level they're at. So when we're, when we're hitting the product area, depending on the age of our students, um, the youngest students, you might have to teach a tool first before you, like you might have to teach them how to use Google Slides, where our older students might be able to, to um, do something that's more advanced with those. And then, um, then within your class, um, you want to look at, they may all use the same tool. You might actually differentiate on the process or differentiate on the content. It doesn't have to be all three. Okay, um, in the next slide, you can, um, I just gave you some tiered activity assignment frameworks for designing it, um, questioning cues and possible products. So you want to just really think about um, what, what you're doing when you're designing them. So that may help you um, with what each of those different tiers looks like using those verbs. And then developing a tiered activity. Um, note on four, that's your complexity. That ties to the chart, that the HES chart that Helen shared earlier um, on the tier, developing the tiered activity. And so um, our next part is digital tools. So I'm just, I'm not gonna share very much about digital tools. There's a lot of them out there. This is uh, Kathy Schrock's um, website. She has some fantastic tools. I think what's important um, listed for each, connected to Bloom's um, for each of the different tools, Android, iPad, um, Chromebook, et cetera. So um, I think what's important is to remember that digital tools are not where we start. So we always start with planning our lesson and then we find a tool that enhances that lesson um, rather than the other way around. And always when we're using tools, we're allowing for voice and choice. So you wanna give them a couple different options. You don't wanna tell every one of your students, particularly AIG students, that they're gonna do a slideshow today. Um, you wanna give them choice in that area. And then make sure that you allow them to come back and share what they've done with their classmates or with an authentic audience of some sort. So sometimes that could be, um, they write a letter on recycling and they share it with um, the school board because um, their school is not recycling or they, um, they write something on gun control and they share it with the troopers, something like that. Um, and then when we go on, there's a slide in here on um, digital, the digital taxonomy for blooms, which parallels the regular revised blooms taxonomy, but also includes the higher order thinking skills. So again, <laughs> building the complexity of, the, of your um, use of digital tools, pulling in those four Cs, you want to think about um, uh, which, where you're hitting, you know, which higher order thinking skill you're hitting. And just because they're um, working on remembering and understanding doesn't mean that they can't um, still use, incorporate the four C's into their, you know, their learning or even some complexity in what they do in design. Okay, so, um, I think I'm going to skip the Padlet, but I am going to note that it's here. And um, if you are interested in clicking on that later, you're welcome to go on in. It's a um, four columns with the different, the four C's there. And we just were asking if teachers might be willing to share some of the tools they use for communication, for creativity, for critical thinking, and for collaboration. Um, here's our digital learning menu is something that you can share with students. So this is basically a choice board. Um, just another idea for gearing towards those four areas. And after that, I've just given you some slides with digital tools on them to think about in each of the different areas of Blooms. Again, from Kathy Schrock's uh, site. So there's lots and lots of tools, but there's only one you. And I just want to encourage you to use your Google apps. Um, we are Google certified, uh, working on Google certification, a lot of us, and we're in a Google district. So Google has apps just within our own toolbox that address each of the different levels of blooms and each of the four C's. Um, so I just want you to, um, don't feel like you need to use something new or take the time to learn something new or use something you're not sure of. That's always fun. 
But when we're just struggling to meet the needs of our students and find something that will work for us um, digitally, remotely, I think sometimes using the Google apps is the way to go. So um, I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, you're welcome to, uh, if you want more training on any of our specific tools, there's lots out there right now on those and lots of YouTube videos. So we can certainly um, make recommendations for you as can all the media specialists and our AIG teachers. Um, um, we, the last part of the presentation is just some additional resources. I know there's a lot of information out there, but these are just some general information sites um, that are kind of my go-to for research or information about gifted education, the National Association for Gifted Children. Um, NCDPI site here talks a little bit about what it looks like in North Carolina and some resources. And I also shared this uh, supporting emotional needs site. Um, some of them are trying to get you to become a member. Don't feel like you need to do that. They just have some good resources to kind of explore on your own time. We've also shared some articles. There is so much out there and it can be very overwhelming. So this is just a few that I've read and found over the last year or two um, that have some good quick points and are easy reads. Birdseed is a great um, site for all types of articles. You can kind of search it by topic in the, within the gifted realm. So definitely check them out. And then these are more specific articles. And then here's just a couple of um, resources for lesson plans and teaching resources that I have found and used over time. Um, this one is has a lot of social emotional learning activities. Mensa for Kids is really good. Um, Science Friday, TED Ed for kids, and they also have an educators one. You may have worked with that. The K-12 site for STEM curr um, curriculum is teaching engineering. And then this last one that I recently discovered is called Open Middle, and it's like a list of open-ended math problems where it starts the same and they all end with the same answer, but the goal, you will have your students be able to um, come up with all kinds of different ways to solve it. And it has it all the way, I think from kindergarten up to middle school and maybe even high school questions based off the mathematical domain. So definitely worth checking out, maybe a resource you can use with some of your online learning. Um, finally, we would like to thank you. I know this went a little over what we were expecting. It is such a wealth of information. Um, we are here. You're welcome to ask us any questions, send us an email, um, send us an invite to do a quick Google Meet to help you in your classrooms, whether it be through digital learning or if we go back anytime soon or next year, um, I, we are available. So don't hesitate to reach out. Please um, click on this link when you are can and fill out a Google exit survey for us just so we can kind of reflect on our presentation. This is new to us. I'm used to standing in front of people and talking. Um, so the whole technology and I apologize again that my internet went out. So hopefully that didn't cause too many issues. Um, and then is there any questions or things in the chat bar, Melissa? Uh, I don't see anything. Uh, I did address Lynetti. I uh, just sent her a quick link. If you want to look at that, it is about pre-assessment. Um, thank you, ladies. You did a great job. There's a wealth of information here. And I know Helen mentioned that she is available for anyone that um, needed assistant at the middle school for Moyoc. I do try to help out at uh, Curry Tuck. So if you are a middle school person, let me know and I'll be glad to help you out there. And again, there's our and it will be in the recorded session as well. So um, we thank you again. Our emails are there. Um, I hope everyone stays safe and your families are healthy. And um, we, we again, we appreciate everything. Any last thoughts? Jill? Uh, just if you have the survey is a three quick three question. And the last one is what would you like to learn more about? So if there's a topic that you'd like us to go more in depth on, uh, I know we hit things fast. Please feel free to add it in there and we'll come back and, and do this again. Thank you everyone for, for taking your time and thank you for going over with us. Thank you ladies, did great. Thank nice you. Thank you. All right. Helen, there were four people that I got, but there should have been five that were missing. So just okay. check over. I'm and I did get a screenshot. That.